For the next two days, we're going to look at alkynes. Alkynes are very similar to alkenes. They do very similar chemistry. They have very similar properties. Only in a lot of ways, they're much simpler. The nomenclature of alkynes looks much like alkenes. So if this compound were an alkene, it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Yeah. So this would be a 2-pentene. But because it's an alkyne, then we change that E-N-E -E ending for a Y-N-E -E ending. And we can also put the 2 in a weird place if we like, something like this, uh, pent-2-ime. So this compound right here, 1, 2, 3, 4, so this would be 1-butyne or but-1-ime. Oh, I missed the 1. Or, because ones are optional, you could also call this butyne. Now, you will notice with these names right here that we did not need to worry about E and Z stereochemistry. And that's because E and Z stereochemistry don't exist in the context of alkynes. They come straight out, and the bond angle is 180 degrees across this triple bond, so it's not like anything can be on the same side. Everything comes off linearly. Now you might notice with this triple bond right here inside of the ring system that, well, the triple bond does come, both of the portions of the triple bond come off the same side, and we're going to get to all of the problems that are created by that in just a second, and we're going to have cyclobutyne, or cyclobut1-ine, or cyclo-1-butyne if you need to specify where that triple bond is, but for now this works. As far as hybridization goes, all of these carbons that are participating in the triple bond are sp3 hybridized. And so we can just drop this sp label on this one um, right there. This terminal alkyne, that's what this one is called, has a hydrogen coming off of it. And so we refer to this as a terminal alkyne just to designate that the alkyne is not embedded within the molecule but rather sits out here on the end. Um, the hydrogen's not hybridized, and the question's asking me to show the hybridization of all the carbons. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that hydrogen. I just wanted to show you that it was there. It's not that important to us. But the other carbons here are sp3 hybridized. And so we'll format that so it looks like a good chemist wrote that. Oops, <laughs> we did not pull that off. Let's try that again. The three is supposed to be superscripted. There we go. And so this carbon right there is sp3 hybridized, that one's sp3 hybridized, and the one out here on the end would be sp3 hybridized as well. Over on this compound, we'd have these SP, the two sp3s, and then this one over here is also sp3 hybridized. There, now we've designated all of the names and the various hybridizations of the players inside of these alkynes. As far as bond angles go, an sp hybridized carbon would have a 180 degree bond angle, so that's what I've shown. Occasionally you'll see, and I do this sometimes when I forget, is you'll actually see us intentionally draw a carbon-carbon triple bond with a bend in it. And that's, I mean, it's not, it's not wrong, it's weird, but it's not wrong. And part of the reason for that is sometimes it's easier to recognize, it's easier to remember that there's actually a carbon right here. And if you put a bend in it, but uh, if we want to show correct bond angles, it's linear. Occasionally, we show them in bend, with bends like that just because we're so used to drawing zigzag lines. But if we want to fix the structure and make it correct, those will always be linear like that. For the next part of the question, we need to think about both heat of combustion and heat of hydrogenation. Remember that combustion is a measurement of the amount of energy that is released when you burn something. And for similar compounds like these alkynes, the most important factor with heat of combustion is the number of carbons. So the highest heat of combustion will be this 2-pentine because it has 5 carbons. The second highest heat of combustion and the lowest heat of combustion need to be given to these two compounds. And now because they have the same number of carbons, then we can start to kind of split hairs over these. Now this is a tough call. There's a couple reasons why. One is that these are not isomers of each other. Um, this one actually had to give up two hydrogens in order to make this into a ring system. So while they both have four carbons, the cyclobutyne has slightly fewer hydrogens. But we can set them both on fire, and what you definitely expect to occur 
is this compound over here is under an intense amount of ring strain. And in fact, I highly doubt that anybody would successfully isolate this compound in the laboratory because you've got an ideal bond angle of 180 that should be there for that SP hybridized carbon. And yet instead what you're dealing with is a 100, uh, sorry, a 90 degree bond angle with that right triangle. So just because there's such a weird feature associated with a cyclic alkyne, that's why we give it the second highest heat of combustion. And this one here would have the lowest heat of combustion. So still carbons are the most important factor. But the truth is that alkynes do not stably exist in a cyclic arrangement if you have fewer than 12 carbons. It just doesn't happen in a system that's stable. So this really is just an incredibly unusual and unstable alkyne. As far as heat of hydrogenation goes, remember that heat of hydrogenation does not care about any of the non-alkyne carbons. Because hydrogenation, all we're going to do is turn this alkyne all the way into an alkane. And in that process, we're going to release energy. We're going to get more energy out of a less stable system. So this triple bond is probably still your least stable system because it's embedded inside of an unrealistically small uh, ring system. In fact, at this point, I almost feel like I'm asking you to appraise the value of a horse when this one over here is a unicorn. Like, clearly, it would be the most valuable, but it just doesn't exist. So why even ask the question? But you know, if, it did, if it did exist, this would be the highest heat of hydrogenation because you have this weird four-membered ring which is not permitted for an alkyne. Now comparing the other two, this is where we learn kind of some more important principles. And I haven't assigned these yet, I'm just moving them around uh, for the lack of nothing else to do with my mouse. So let's now think about this. This is a mono-substituted alkyne. This is a di-substituted alkyne. Just like we saw with alkenes, mono versus di-substituted makes the di-substituted compound more stable. And the mono-substituted compound would be less stable. So there's a lot going on with this question. With heat of combustion, it's the number of carbons that matters. And after that, we start dealing with the fact that there's all kinds of strain that exists in this uh, unusual four-membered cyclobutyne. And now when we get to heat of hydrogenation, this allows us to ignore all the rest of the carbons and just focus right in on that pi system. And this pi bond right here is uh, by far the most strained. And then after we have kind of a more linear unstrained pi systems, then we go with the dye substituted being more stable and therefore giving us uh, less energy when we hydrogenate this. And the mono substituted would be the more stable of these two over here. So kind of excluding this weirdness over here of this compound. What we learn is that uh, heat of hydrogenation favors a lower value for the more substituted alkyne. Unlike alkenes that can be mono, di, tri, or tetra substituted, alkynes can only be mono substituted or di substituted. Mono substituted alkenes are more commonly referred to as terminal. I said that wrong. Monosubstituted alkynes are more commonly referred to as terminal alkynes, and disubstituted alkynes are sometimes called embedded uh, alkynes. Uh, embedded alkynes like this, right? meaning that they're inserted inside of the molecule. And so it's odd, but a uh, disubstituted alkyne is more commonly just referred to as a disubstituted alkyne. A monosubstituted alkyne tends to be called a terminal alkyne. And so these are all the words we use to describe these ones. The last thing to think about is the issues of density and water solubility. And so what we're going to do here, whoa, uh, did not, there we go. We're going to look at these two factors, density and solubility in water, which I should probably just call that water solubility, but it's already typed. The density of alkynes is similar to the density of alkenes, which is similar to the density of alkanes which is similar to the density of most organic compounds, which is about 0.8 grams per milliliter. So this is going to be in that ballpark for all of these compounds. Now, an alkyne actually forms slightly better dispersion force interactions than an alkene because the double pi bond right here, is, it, it allows it to slosh more. 
So this leads to a slight decrease in the density relative to alkenes, but it's such a small difference that we just kind of assume they have the same density. The, the solubility in water is also incredibly low for all of these compounds. Again, because the triple bond pi system can oscillate more inside of the pi system. It's just a bigger bathtub full of water sloshing back and forth with both of those pi bonds. You end up with a bit more polarity, which means it would be very, very slightly more soluble in water. But all your alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes are going to have extraordinarily low solubility in water. So basically we say they have no solubility. And, and, and that's true for any of these compounds. And it doesn't really matter how you design your alkyne unless you can give water something like a hydrogen bond to convince the water to take the alkyne into solution it's not going to do it so just a regular alkyne like this any one of these three is going to have essentially no solubility in water the next thing we want to look at is a comparison of ethane ethene and ethine now ethane is two sp3 hybridized carbons with six hydrogens ethene which has a common name of ethylene is two sp2 hybridized carbons with four hydrogens notice how the addition of this pi bond forced me to give up two of my hydrogens if i now go from ethene or ethylene the common name to ethine or acetylene is the common name and put that triple bond in there, then I have to give up two more hydrogens. So every pi bond comes at the cost of two hydrogens. Now, in terms of all the features of this one, first let's talk about the bond length. A carbon-carbon single bond is longer than a carbon-carbon double bond, which is longer than a carbon-carbon triple bond. So these bonds are going to get progressively shorter and shorter as you move from left to right. In general chemistry, we explain that they're pulled tighter by the presence of the pi bond and tighter still by the presence of two pi bonds. This is a lie, but it is a useful lie. ChemDraw likes to model sp3, sp2, and sp hybridized orbitals like this and this is a good model right here this front side of the orbital is the one that participates in a meaningful bonding interaction and the back side of the orbital is the one that's just kind of a, a residual leftover of the p orbital that used to be there when you have an sp3 hybridized orbital this means that you essentially took one s orbital which is kind of this short fat thing this is an s orbital and you mix it together with three different p orbitals where we consider each p orbital looks something like this now uh, an animals aren't capable of having four parents that all mix their genes together but plants sort of can so we'll go with this model imagine a situation where you had a plant and i'm going to go ahead and put these p orbitals remember they're px py and pz so they kind of overlap here in a weird three-dimensional way but if you had a plant that was made up of one short fat plant and it cross hybridized with three long skinny plants, then you would expect that resulting plant to be 75% long and skinny and 25% short and fat. That short and fat is what's referred to as S character in these orbitals. So S character in an sp3 orbital is due to is 25 percent and it's because when you say something is sp3 hybridized what you're saying is i made it from an s orbital and three p orbitals and i stuck them in a blender and this is what i spit out and it's still mostly p orbitals and what that means is that the p orbital shape which is long and skinny shows up in an sp3 hybridized orbital in an sp2 hybridized orbital instead of <laughs> well i don't know what i did right there in an sp2 hybridized orbital instead of having three of these p orbitals sp2 orbitals only use two of these p orbitals and so the s character of an sp2 hybridized orbital is 33 percent meaning that it's one part s and two parts p 
that actually affects the shape of the sp3 orbital so the s character here is 33 percent and then hopefully you guess already that the s character of an sp hybridized orbital which is where i take one p orbital and one s orbital and combine them together is 50 percent the fact that it's 50 percent s character has several effects the most important effect is the resulting hybridized orbital looks different and so um, again chemdraw only has really one way of showing a hybridized orbital and chemdraw shows it like this every time and this particular model doesn't actually show us a very accurate difference between the sp3s and the sp2s and the sps because it would make them all look the same and so what i want to do is try to come up with a model that shows how these things are actually a little bit different from each other and so what i'm going to do is kind of make my sp orbital look like this sorry sp3 we're going to pretend it looks like this and on the front side right here i have the uh the, the bonding orbital and it's long and it's skinny because it's 75 percent p and only 25 percent s and so i'm going to put the sp3s up here this is approximately what their orbitals would kind of look like proportionally speaking and then i'll move the s's down the sp down here and the sp2 right over here so here i kind of have a diagram now with an sp2 orbital it is 33 percent s and what that does to the shape of the orbital is it makes it shorter and fatter uh, still a little bit elongated but it's going to be shorter and squattier because it has a higher percentage of that short fat s character and finally when we get down to the sp orbitals they come out and they are very short and very fat and so we'll try to exaggerate this just a little bit something like this there's kind of these squatty orbitals right here and the effect of these of this kind of this combined shortening and fattening as you get more and more s character is that's actually why the bonds between the carbons are shorter it's not because the triple bond somehow reels it in tighter that was a lie and while it was useful the truth is that an sp hybridized carbon will make a shorter bond because its hybridized bonding orbital has a greater percentage of s character and the s character gives it kind of that short fat characteristic now the truth is this is still a lie it just happens to be a much more useful lie than the previous lie that we told you back in gen Chem. one of the consequences of this new lie which becomes your new truth when you're learning chemistry that these orbitals get progressively shorter and squattier is it also explains their increased electronegativity meaning that when you have an sp hybridized carbon it forms its bonds using orbitals that are closer to the carbon this is shorter fatter sp orbital and therefore the carbon pulls the electrons in more tightly and that is the definition of electronegativity so if we use the standard electronegativity table value for carbon of 2.5 as its electronegativity value that's probably true for an sp3 hybridized carbon but it's going to be 2.4 maybe 2. Point, sorry 2. Point, it's going to be higher for an sp2 hybridized carbon so we'd say it's like 2.7 and by the time we get to an sp hybridized carbon it's closer to 2.9 so my point is that as you go from sp3 to sp2 to sp you become increasingly more electronegative on that same carbon atom so this table forces us to use some of that knowledge so for example the length of between the two carbons in ethane is going to be longer than ethene and so the reason for that a we need to explain this trend is that sp3 whoops sp3 hybridized carbons are um have sorry not uh, they have longer hybridized orbitals and make longer bonds than sp2 and sp hybridized orbitals so that explains the size the bond length trend that we see across the first row right here ethane has the longest bonds because it's sp3 ethyne has the shortest bonds because it's sp hybridized this 
letter B looks at bond dissociation enthalpy. So we need to define bond dissociation enthalpy, and it is the energy required to break the bond. Um, and in the case of a triple bond, it would be bonds, plural. So for example, when you want to break the two carbons apart in ethane, you are breaking this bond right here. So bond dissociation enthalpy refer, refers to cutting this bond right here. Bond dissociation enthalpy for ethene is cutting both of those bonds, and for ethine is cutting all three of those bonds. And so you'll notice that it's an increasing value. It keeps going up and up and up, and so in letter B, uh, we see it's harder to break ethine than ethene or eth oh, change it for me ethane due to the fact that you are breaking more bonds. Um, now, one of the things that you should have noticed is that it costs the marginal cost is decreased so for example with ethane it costs 375 kilojoules per mole to break that first bond two times 375 is 750 but it did not cost 750 to break apart the double bond of ethene and the reason for that is the first bond of ethene the sigma bond costs you 375 but the pi bond only costs you the difference between 720 and 375. And so let's think about what that means mathematically. In ethane, the sigma bond cost us 375 kilojoules to break apart. In ethene, it costs us a total of 720 kilojoules to break apart, but 375 of that was because of the sigma bond. This means that the total, so if you look at ethene, it costs you a total of 720 kilojoules per mole to break both of the bonds. If we consider that 375 units of energy were spent just breaking the sigma bond, then that means we only spent 345 to break apart that pi bond. What that tells us is the pi bond is weaker than a sigma bond, or more importantly, that two separate sigma bonds are stronger than a sigma and a pi bond together. We can figure out how much additional energy it cost ethine. So ethine cost 961 total units of energy to break apart all three bonds equals 961. 375 is how much it costs to break apart that sigma bond. 345 was how much it cost to break apart the first pi bond and 241 is how much it costs to break the second pi bond. This is an important idea, that the sigma bond is the strongest bond, the first pi bond is going to be weaker, and then the second pi bond is going to be weaker still. And we're gonna get into this later when we realize that alkynes are actually more reactive than alkenes because that second pi bond is easier to break than the first pi bond of an alkene. So I'm going to copy and paste this over, just kind of so I have a note. And this kind of helps me see a mathematical explanation of letter B right here. In letter C, the bond dissociation enthalpy is not between the carbons now, but it's between the carbons and the hydrogens. And so this is asking the question, not how much energy does it take to break the carbon-carbon bonds, but how much energy does it take for me to break apart that carbon-hydrogen bond? This is actually a, a more fair comparison. If I'm breaking the carbon-hydrogen bonds right here, it's still just a single sigma bond that I'm clipping right here. So why is it not the same value across the board? Okay, let's go back and look. It is easier to clip a hydrogen off of ethane, and it gets progressively harder to clip the hydrogen off of ethine. Okay. Going back to our diagram, that means that this cut is easier than this cut right here. And the reason that these become progressively harder is when you cut a bond in bond dissociation enthalpy, you actually, energy required to break the bonds into two radicals. And so what that means is in letter C right here, we are cutting the hydrogen and giving the hydrogen one of the electrons in the bond. 
in what used to be in the old bond. We'll say the bond that got cut, the bond that's broken. Um, that didn't like, did not want to do close quotation. Okay. Uh, this is an appropriate use of air quotes. So it's an old bond now because we broke it. And the issue is ethine, um, see if I can spell this right, has the most electronegative carbon. Uh, of ethane and ethene. And so therefore it will cost more energy to pull that electron off of the carbon with the hydrogen when you cut that bond. So what I'm saying is that as I move from left to right the carbon is becoming increasingly more electronegative. And when I cut this bond, I'm not just plucking off the hydrogen, I'm also taking one of those two electrons with it. And a more electronegative carbon atom, which is what I have over here on the right side, is going to charge you more energy, not just to cut the bond, but also to take one of those electrons off with it. So if we were to simplify the letter C down to a single incorrect answer, a single word incorrect answer, that would be worth some partial credit. It's just an issue of electronegativity. The stock answer for why in organic chemistry is usually something to do with electronegativity. Um, and then the second one is sterics. It's either electronegativity or sterics are ultimately how you explain most questions you get asked in organic chemistry. We already did the calculation for the percent S character of carbon. So for letter D, we're going to see the diagram. Um, and I'm going to copy and paste this diagram that I made earlier so that we can kind of have a spatial representation of what's going on with these. And so again, if you don't remember what I was trying to explain here, it's that when you make ethane, it is sp3 hybridized, meaning that it's one part s and three parts p. Well, one part out of four parts total is 25%. That's where those percentages come from. The last trend, and probably the most important trend that we're going to talk about here, is, uh, I guess we have to define letter G still, but let's look now at letter E, and this has to do with the pKa. And this is, once again, an issue of electronegativity. So a more electronegative carbon is less attached to its hydrogen. Okay. Now this may seem to be at odds with the bond dissociation enthalpy because the more electronegative carbon in ethyne was more attached to the bond. And the difference here is when you break something with bond dissociation enthalpy, you are breaking apart the bond and giving one of those electrons over to the hydrogen. With an acid, you're breaking apart the bond, but you're giving none of the electrons to the hydrogen. You're giving both of those electrons to the carbon. So this is the difference between thinking about an acid right here. If I move this little dashed line over, what you're really asking is which of these carbons right here cares the least about its attached hydrogen? Well, what's the problem with getting rid of the hydrogen? Well, the problem with getting the, rid of the hydrogen is now you have to deal with this negative charge and the associated lone pair. Well, that's not a problem for the most electronegative carbon. So what we find is the more S character that a particular carbon atom has, the more it can pull on the bond and the less it's interested in the hydrogen, therefore it becomes increasingly, increasingly more acidic. So we can draw a line right here that shows more acidic. And those are the words that I try to say here with letter E, that in its initial electronegativity, this trend moving from left to right we become increasingly lower pKa's, meaning it's more acidic, because a more electronegative carbon is less attached to its hydrogen. This is a huge difference in pKa value. Remember, it's a logarithmic scale right here, so we're dropping nearly 35 orders of magnitude going from ethane down to ethyne. This is now something that is acidic enough for us to actually do some chemistry with. And we're going to look at those in the next lesson of what is it that you can do with an ethyne once you pop that hydrogen off of it. The last one we need to talk about is letter G, and this is define the percent S character. 
And so this is the percent of the atomic, sorry, of the hybridized orbital that originally came from an S atomic orbital. And then hopefully this diagram helps you understand what I mean by percent S character. If it's SP3, that means it came from 1S orbital and 3P orbitals. If it's SP2, it came from 1S and 2Ps. And if it's SP, it came from an S and a P. So it's the percent of this final hybridized orbital that originally derived from an atomic orbital. The next question is going to ask us, ask us to show some acid-base reactions. We're going to take ethane, ethylene, and acetylene, which fortunately we've been dealing with those molecules before. This is ethane, this is ethylene, and this is acetylene. Um, those are the common names. Ethane only has a, sorry, it has a, its systematic name is all it has. It doesn't have any special common name. Ethylene can be called ethene or acetylene, and ethine can also equally correctly be called acetylene. So this is ethylene or ethene, acetylene or ethine, and then finally just ethane. In all cases, sodium amide can come over here and rip a hydrogen off of one of the carbons. That produces a carbanion, that is a carbon that carries a negative charge, and ammonia. In terms of acid-base chemistry, ammonia becomes my conjugate acid, and the hydrocarbon becomes my acid. The direction of equilibrium, we can't predict that until we know what the pKa of the hydrocarbon is. For ethane, the pKa, given on this previous table right here, was 62. For ethene, it's 45, and for ethine, it's 26. So let's just copy and paste those pKa values over here. Um, and so here we have a 62, a 45, and a 26. In terms of the mechanistic details, in every case, the mechanism is going to look very similar. For ethane, your amide is going to come over here and pull one of these hydrogens off then these electrons are going to drop down onto the carbon and you're going to end up producing both ammonia right, which is an inorganic compound so we don't necessarily need to show that so we're going to leave that up here but it's also going to produce some organic compound and this will be the carbanion version of the thing i'm going to pop that off and that off we'll put a negative charge on that carbon and a lone pair the resulting conjugate acid ammonia has a pKa of 36, the ethane has a pKa of 62, the lower pKa is the stronger acid, so equilibrium will favor the formation of the weaker acid. And in fact, it favors it uh, by such an overwhelming majority that this really doesn't do any chemistry at all. In fact, if we were to show this as an arrow, it would basically look like this, and really, to no appreciable extent, can amide even reasonably hope to be able to pull that, hydro, that carbon off. So mechanistically, the question asks you to show it. So you want to show what I just gave you right there. But it's not going to produce any meaningful quantity of product because your original acid is so very, very weak that even amide, which is a strong base, is not strong enough to pull a hydrogen off of it. So what is, what, instead, let's come back up here and use ethene. Now, mechanistically, it's about the same. Uh, actually, it's going to be a little harder to show because of weird bond angles. So I need to move this arrow around right here. Um, we're going to end up now producing... So this is the acid-base reaction. Okay? Let me get this out of the way. The amide will come over here and pull hydrogen off of ethene. And we're going to end up with a different carbocation. Okay? So this one... Um, let's see if it'll let, nope, would not let me do that. Let's drop the double bond in right there. This is the resulting carbocation that we end up making right there. We also end up producing ammonia. So this is the full acid-base chemistry. The base pulls the hydrogen off the acid. Here's my conjugate base and my conjugate acid. As I noted before, ethylene or ethene has a pKa of 45. That higher pKa value makes it the weaker acid and equilibrium still overwhelmingly favors the formation of the reactant, which basically means no chemistry is going to happen here uh, to any appreciable extent. Nothing happens. You try to add amide to an alkane, the alkane will laugh at the futile attempts of the amide to pull hydrogen off 
You put amide with an alkene, still no chemistry will really happen. When this starts to change is when we put back the alkene and we bring in the alkyne. This is where we actually start to get some meaningful chemistry occurring. And so we can drag that arrow down right there. We ultimately end up producing a carbon-carbon triple bond in our final product. So let me fix that. And I'll go ahead and straighten out the bond angle because if not, it bugs me. All right, so the pKa of our acid, ethyne, is 26. And the pKa of my conjugate acid is 36. And the equilibrium constant, the KEQ, is equal to 10 raised to the power of the difference of those two pKa. So these pKa values are 10 units apart, meaning that your final equilibrium constant is going to favor products with an equilibrium of 10 to the 10th. Uh, 10 to the 10th is 10 trillion. For every one of the molecules that doesn't undergo acid-base chemistry, we're going to have 10 trillion of them that do. So it is absolutely fair to think about this now as a reaction that favors products. The point of this whole question is to get you to realize that we can, using amide, sodium amide is a commercially available base, we can go ahead and use that to deprotonate an alkyne. The solvent for this reaction is typically the conjugate acid of my base. We've seen that idea before. So they usually solvate this reaction in ammonia. So they'll just show that here at the arrow. That the solvent is ammonia. And then we end up producing ammonia as a product. But since ammonia is inorganic, we don't need this. And kind of the simplest stripped down mechanism of this reaction would look just like that. Now that we've talked about the physical properties of alkynes, let's go ahead and dig into the first of the chemical reactions that alkynes will undergo. And this is the alkali metal reduction of an alkyne. So we'll start off with the typical alkyne. Here is 3-hexyne. And I've identified the carbons that are part of the alkyne just because we're going to focus on them. And what we do is we add sodium metal to this reaction. Now, in the past, when we've encountered sodium, it has been a spectator ion, and we did not care about it. In this particular reaction, the sodium is actually sodium metal, not the ion, and so it carries its electron with it, and it is very reactive. The electron from the sodium donates into this pi system in a three-half-headed arrow mechanism like we saw with other radical reactions. So this is another free radical reaction, but it is different than the ones that I showed you before in that it does not involve the initiation, um, carbon radical formation, and propagation steps. It's its own beast. But we are going to memorize this one as a four-step mechanism, and that makes it easier to keep track of. This first step is an electron transfer. And what's unique about the arrow coming off the sodium is the sodium is not donating its electron into forming a bond, it's just tossing its electron into the system, like a grenade, and then it leaves. And so we end up with one additional electron pushed into our pi system, which ends up breaking the pi bond, and we end up with a carbanion on one position, that's a carbon with a negative charge, and a carbon radical on another position. This is a deeply unhappy molecule. And so it's very high energy, what we've just done, but we can get away with it because the alkali metal sodium has, is relatively easy to oxidize. So it donates its, its electron and then kind of floats away as a spectator ion back to the role of us not caring about it anymore because it's no longer sodium metal. It's now that sodium ion after it loses its electron. This first electron transfer step is followed by a proton transfer. And here's a case where the solvent matters. We typically solvate sodium metal in ammonia because the ammonia, NH3, will act as an acid in the next step, in this proton transfer step. So P plus T stands for proton transfer. E minus T stands for electron transfer. So to help you keep track, let's think about this as an electron transfer step followed by a proton transfer step. The approximate pKa of an sp2 hybridized carbon is about 45. The approximate pKa of a neutral nitrogen is 36. Equilibrium will favor the formation of the weaker acid. So in terms of acid-base chemistry, this makes sense to us, or at least it should, 
based on the pKa values. Now certainly the radical will influence those pKa values, but not in a way that disrupts the overall equilibrium. And we expect this proton transfer step to happen very, cur very quickly, driven by the electron transfer step that occurred first. Then we follow this proton transfer with another electron transfer. See the pattern? Electron transfer, proton transfer, electron transfer, and I'll let you guess what the fourth step is going to be that we'll talk about in just a second. In the second electron transfer step, another metal atom of ammonia tosses its electron into the system like a grenade and just leaves that electron behind and we end up with a carbanion. This ammonia is generally added to the reaction container as a, a piece of sodium metal. Sorry, this sodium is added to the reaction container as a piece of sodium metal. They often refer to it as a sodium mirror, and that's because sodium is reactive with the air and the water in the air and will corrode on the outer edge if you have a solid uh, block of ammonia metal. So you slice it. It slices with a butter knife. It's a very soft metal. And you expose that mirror of sodium, and then you just dunk that in your reaction flask. And on the surface of the sodium, some of the sodium atoms will break free, float along in solution, and drop their electrons to become sodium ions and produce the carbon ions that we saw in the first step and the third step. Notice too that in the third step right here, I'm finally distinguishing the stereochemistry of my double bond. And this reaction overwhelmingly produces the trans isomer as a product. And it does that because this particular carbon radical right here, I'm going to show this a different way, is in equilibrium between sp and sp2.5. You think, sorry, sp2. You can think about the uh, hybridization of a carbon radical as being, in this case, sp1.5. So it's not sp1, it's not sp2, it's kind of somewhere in the middle. And during this equilibrium process that occurs while this carbon radical exists, the ethyl group that's connected to that carbon radical is going to cheat up and be on the opposite side of the other ethyl group so as to reduce the steric collisions that would occur. So here's my attempt to show the unhybridized p orbital that you would see in an sp hybridized carbon and then that same p orbital shown as a hybridized sp2 orbital here and that's when the ethyl group can kind of swing up. So with a higher probability the ethyl group will end up on the opposite side of whatever is sterically bulky on the other star side of what used to be my alkyne. And the take-home lesson is that this reaction produces almost exclusively the trans product. One more step because you can't stop with an ion, so there's going to be, we went electron transfer, proton transfer, electron transfer, and now we have another proton transfer step using yet again the ammonia as the acid. So we use the same electron donor and the same acid in both of the kind of this, the repeated sequence of electron transfer, proton transfer, electron transfer, proton transfer. We get to our final product and overwhelmingly we get the trans isomer out of this reaction. We're going to look uh, in the next lesson at how we end up with the cis isomer because you can reduce an alkyne to an alkene and end up with the cis isomer. And a spoiler alert, it's going to end up being catalytic hydrogenation. But in today's reaction, we're looking at this free radical mediated mechanism that involves an alkali metal donating its electron to the system and we end up with the trans alkene. So this is the alkali metal reduction of an alkyne. Here is the kind of the streamlined, simplified view of that mechanism, just kind of put in a single location for your viewing enjoyment. If we go back up to the top of the lesson, you are not required to produce definitions here, but you might want to make some notes. Um, for example, the nomenclature of alkynes is similar to alkenes. And then also we should put a note here that alkynes are less priority in terms of priority than alkenes. The physical property is similar to alkenes, slightly more polarizable. This means that the pi system in a triple bond can actually oscillate back and forth more wildly and leads to stronger dispersive force interactions and greater dipole-dipole attractions. So stronger IMFs across the board. You get stronger intermolecular forces with alkynes than you do with alkenes, but I should emphasize that it's very slightly stronger. Um, 
structural features, we saw uh, the stability issues, where in terms of stability, we saw dye substituted was greater than mono substituted, uh, which is generally much greater than ring alkynes. There are cases where you can get 12 carbons in a ring structure, and then you start to see alkynes do okay in terms of their stability. Acidity, um, and this is going to become a bigger issue. They are easily deprotonated. So, sorry, terminal alkynes are, and I think the better term is readily deprotonated by amide base ions. That's NH2. And usually we use sodium amide and that you can buy a box of it and it does okay as long as you keep it uh, away from any water. Otherwise it'll just tear the hydrogens off water. And then the alkali metal reduction is that electron transfer, proton transfer, electron transfer, proton transfer, um, free radical mechanism to produce trans alkenes. Those are the key details for today. Um, again, I've tried to identify the homework questions that I think are ex especially important. That's what the asterisk C's right here mean. And then, oh, whoops, you're not supposed to look at the answer key to the chalkboard problems, but those are the chalkboard problems.